Hey, it's great to be here uh, with you all. And uh, yes, thanks, Heath. I'm the book that should be coming out well before the pillar one is that I have been writing a book on the Sermon on the Mount of Human Flourishing, and uh, that's been a joy. And but that isn't what I'm talking about today. So, <laughs> but thank you for that. Uh, what I want to talk about instead is uh, interact a little bit with this massive book. I don't think. Probably anybody in here has read this, probably. Maybe has anyone read Francis Watson's? Oh, some of you have. Good. Excellent. Okay. Well, I really do believe one of the most significant books to be written in recent years in gospel studies is, in fact, Watson's gospel writing, a canonical perspective. Watson, who's a <coughs> professor at the other Durham, the one in England, the older one, uh, is well known for his many significant contributions uh, to biblical studies, particularly on theological hermeneutics. You may have run across him in that. And, and this book... Uh, it's not without its uh, detractor, certainly, but its, its size and the reactions it's already gotten are showing that it's going to be an important book to wrestle with. There was recently an a issue of Journal for Study New Testament interacting with this and others with some heavyweight scholars. So the, the context of this particular paper is that at SBL next month in Atlanta, uh, in the Matthew section that I'm involved in, it's a long-standing section there, um, we are doing a series of invited papers in interaction with Watson. And what that is, they're actually papers on Matthew, then interacting with what Watson would have to say about it possibly, and then he's going to respond as well. And so it should be really fun. And so shamelessly, what I want to do today is present uh, the current version of my paper that I'm going to be presenting next month at SBL which I think will be beneficial for you. I don't anticipate most of you will probably end up at the Matthew section at SBL uh, this year. Many, maybe some of you might. Uh, beneficial for you, but also beneficial for me because I really want and value your feedback um, at any level of, of what's going on in, in what I'm going to be saying today. Now, <clears throat> Many of the others at that session, uh, all the presenters, of course, at the session will be well familiar with Watson's work, but I, again, don't anticipate that most of you are here. So what I've given you there on the handout, as you'll see there, is this, are the seven theses that Watson ends the book with. There's obviously a lot going on in the book, a lot of other detailed things, um, but he sums them up. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief summary here, and then you can look at those theses as well. Uh, so just a couple of comments about what he's doing there. Um, it's a big book. It's 600 plus pages, so it's not easy to summarize super succinctly, but I think his point is pretty clear. And Watson's point is that the writing of the Gospels was a dynamic process that involved uh, many sources, both oral and written, and that soon enough, through various twists and turns in the East and the Western traditions of the church are a little different on this, Obviously, a canon comes to be clearly developed, and particularly the fourfold gospel book, or the Tetrauangelion develops, as we call it. And, and in the development of that fourfold book, then, that has some implications. On the one hand, it forces us to read and invites us to read those four gospels together as one intertextual book. And at the same time, it does cut off the dialogue between those four gospels and the lots of other gospels that are actually being written, both in sayings collections as well as in actual gospels. And we have a lot of these, you know, Thomas and Judas and the Egerton gospel and infancy gospels. I just recently read through almost all of them again. And some of them I had never read to my shame, even despite being a gospel scholar and <clears throat> was just struck by how much there is and, and some, some themes in them as well. Now, Watson's point is, that <clears throat> from that there are two different perspectives to think about this. On the one hand, there is the recognition of the canon and that that's a valuable and for a faith community, in our case, we'd say the Orthodox faith community to deem these as canonical and others as not is entirely uh, valid and there are arguments that can be made for that. And that that results again in a certain kind of reading. We read the four canonical gospels differently than when you do the others. That's fine, Watson says. At the same time, from an historical development standpoint, you can also acknowledge that uh, the wide range of gospel materials that are being written that Luke 1 refers to and that we have evidence of, that there was a lot more interaction between those and even interdependence between those different documents as they're developing. We as evangelicals especially tend to think of canon in the category of these are the good ones, all the other ones are bad, or these are the true ones, all the other ones are untrue. Watson's argument is that there, those are two different discussions to have. If I can summarize him, I think I'm summarizing him fairly. There's the canonical 
discussion, and that results in a certain kind of reading, but that's different necessarily than the historical development of the interrelationship of those gospel texts. So that's, I think, what Watson's trying to argue. It's a, it's a nuanced argument. It's one that there's something for everyone to hate in, certainly. <laughs> kind of reminds me of Rivard Childs in that sense. You know, he falls between the stools. People hate him on both sides, and there's some ways in which that uh, there's some actually analogs, I think, to what Childs is doing. So I give you there the seven theses <clears throat> uh, that Watson gives at the end of the book. Of course, there's a lot more detail in the book. What I want to do today in our time, and somebody keep me uh, aware of the time if you could, um, is that again, I want to make, make an argument about Matthew, a, a, an original argument about Matthew itself that has nothing to do with Watson. And then at the end, I want to ask WWFD, what would Francis do? Or what, what would Watson say um, about that? Okay, so my thesis, I'll just give it to you right here at the front, about Matthew is this. This is in the middle of page one there of the handout. At a foundational level, Matthew's gospel both reflects and is arguing for what I'm calling, quote, a theological epistemology. The coming of Jesus the Messiah is an act of revelation that separates all peoples into those who know and understand. That's the theological. It's revelatory. Um, the people who know and understand and those who don't. And then the implication of this um, is that this eschatological revelatory act that is coming about through Jesus deconstructs who the people of God are, and then reconstitutes them and redefines them, not according to ethnicity, but according to their faith response in Jesus or their reception of divine knowledge now in that sense, okay? So that's what I'm gonna be arguing and try to unpack this as we, as we go along uh, throughout this. And just, if, you have, if we have any philosophers here, I hope we do, I'm a philosopher trapped in a New Testament body, as I often say. Um, I wanna say that I hope I didn't bait and switch you with theological epistemology in Matthew. I wasn't trying to say I was gonna give a philosophical discourse. I've greatly benefited from uh, all different kinds of this, uh, whether it's William Abraham, Abraham's philosophy of religion kind of approach to epistemology, I've benefited from that, or Plantiga or Wolterstorff. Uh, more philosophical and theological approaches, or uh, more recently, Drew Johnson. I don't know if some of you have run across, I know Heath knows him as well. A more almost biblical theology of a sort, kind of epistemological. I benefit from all those. That's not what I'm doing. The closest to what I'm doing here is probably to Drew, but I'm doing a Matthew, literary theological reading of Matthew, and then trying to connect it uh, to Watson in that sense. So, point two then, Matthew's five major discourses in theological epistemology. Now, <clears throat> it's an honor to have uh, a real Matthewian scholar here as well. Chuck Quarles, of course, is a friend and, and one whom I respect. And there might be some other Matthew scholars. I know there's other New Testament guys here, but other Matthew scholars as well. Whether you are a Matthew scholar or not, it doesn't take very long when you're reading Matthew to very quickly run into one of his most famous aspects, and that's what we might call the FMDs or the five major discourses. This is a, a well-recognized part of Matthew that Matthew not only basically follows the narrative story of Mark, but he has these big big chunks of teaching material that from way back, I mean, we've got quotes from Calvin and others recognizing that these are thematic collections, including famous things like the Sermon on the Mount. They're collections, again, to paraphrase Calvin, that, G, that Matthew has taken from other parts of the Jewish traditions and put them into a thematic collection. I mean, that's a, that's a well-recognized um, uh, aspect of Matthew, and I list for you what those five major discourses are generally, you know, the verses you could press into a little bit more where they break down, but the Sermon on the Mount, of course, the most famous one, then the missions or witness discourse, the collection of parables, the, the ecclesiological discourse, and then I just recently had a conversion, a public conversion about this, what I'm now calling the judgment discourse, not the eschatological discourse, because I've recently converted to believe that chapter 23 is included in that last discourse. And if you're not a Matthew scholar, that probably means nothing to you, but that's kind of a big deal. Uh, whether you believe 24 to 25 is the fifth major discourse or whether it's 23 to 25, it's a big debate in the world. So um, Matthew, I would describe it this way, you know, Matthew's Greek yogurt has these five rupe, ripe blueberries in them that in my, perspective, make the other gospels on the shelf appear rather plain and bland, or maybe that's just my Matthewan prejudice shining through, I'm not sure. But so, so this again is a well-recognized part of Matthew. There's more we could say about this. Um, as the FMDs of the five major discourses have worked their way out in Matthew's scholarship and interpretation, the main way has been the question you'll see in the commentaries and monographs, what is the relationship of the five major discourses to the structure of Matthew? And the structure of Matthew 
is, I don't know, Chuck, you can speak this as well. I find it fascinating. And it's like a, it's a cottage industry. How is Matthew structured? It's like a major discussion in scholarship. And I have spent many years thinking about it. And I feel like I finally come to some pretty strong conclusions, firm conclusions in my mind about how Matthew structured. Well, that's the main way that the five major discourses come into Matthew studies is with the question of, is Matthew a narrative that has these five blocks kind of thrown in there? Or is Matthew five big blocks of teaching that then he, you know, strings a, a narrative between or whatever, or some permutation of them? Most, and there are scholars on all extremes of it, you might imagine. Most scholars today following the lead of Dale Allison and others would argue that Matthew is a combination, a beautiful combination of narratives and discourses that are woven together. So if you, if we had more time to sort of look at the structure and flow of Matthew, it's really a, it's a beautiful piece of art. He's got a, an introduction, <clears throat> and again, debates on where the extent of all these things, but an introduction in the, the first four chapters, roughly. And then you have a series of discourses and narratives. So discourses being, again, the collected teachings and, the, and then the stories that you find mostly in Mark, all woven together, not just in a hodgepodge kind of random pieces of pineapple in the church potluck jello, but actually woven together in a perfect way, I think that, that many of us have come to sort of recognize now. The only difference I would suggest relative to Allison is that Allison argues, and he's the leading kind of Matthew scholar on these kind of things, um, is that Allison would argue that uh, the narratives are followed by a discourse that serves as a segue to the next narrative. I've analyzed Matthew to recognize that there are five major discourse narrative blocks that begin with the Sermon on the Mount, and then certainly the text after it is the narrative that is tied to it, then the next discourse again. So five to seven, and then eight to nine follows that. Chapter 10, verses 11 to 12 follows that. So it's not entirely dissimilar than Allison, but, but a little different as well. Now, so what I've said so far, there's nothing, except for the last thing I just said, there's nothing overly new. Here's the contribution I'd like to really suggest to you in this paper today. <clears throat> and that is that these five major discourses are not only beautifully and well-crafted, and if you've spent any time in the Sermon on the Mount or any parts of Matthew, they are masterpieces. I mean, if any of those is worthy of being a classic, let alone put all together. But not only are each of those five major discourses well-crafted, well-honed, collected, thematic, systematic uh, presentations that are memorizable that Matthew gives us, not only are they individually that, I'd like to suggest to you that that same level of skill that Matthew put into collecting the five, he actually ties all five together into a meta theme and there are connections between them. And it's somewhat surprising to find that so far, and again, if you know something or find something, let me know, I've not been able to find hardly anyone that has even asked that question, let alone made a cohesive argument about how the five major discourses might be linked together, not just individual blueberries in the yogurt, but there's actually a string between the blueberries. I guess that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a good analogy, but some way that they're connected together. Um, the closest you'd have in it would be a famous guy named B.W. Bacon, so can't be all bad, right, from the 1930s, who was very influential in Matthew's, in Matthean scholarship, because he was the, one of the first people to recognize that Matthew has five major discourses, like he was like the big person to emphasize that. The reason I bring him up here again is because Bacon not only recognized that Matthew had five major discourses, his argument was that the five discourses of Matthew are analogs to the Pentateuch. And so that becomes an important part of Bacon's whole discussion of Matthew. Interestingly, everyone now acknowledges, except for a very few Kingsbury and others, but everyone acknowledges that Matthew has these five major discourses, but no one follows him, or very few people follow him on the Pentateuch connection. There are, Lightheart has actually kind of revisited that a little bit and some other people, but most people don't. And I especially, imagine making that kind of argument in the 1930s. If you know anything about the history of interpretation, I mean, that's when Koenig Wissenschaft was, you know, had his, his strong arm on all of biblical studies. And so the, the idea that there's this kind of almost allegorical reading is what Bacon is in effect suggesting. There was no room for that in, in mid 20th century biblical scholarship, I'd suggest to you, except for among, you know, people who are fully committed to um, medieval interpretation or something. So I, I, he didn't really get much hearing in terms of, or much long lasting impact, I should say, in terms of connecting the five discourses to the Pentateuch. Are you with me on that? You understand? So that, that just wasn't palatable, I think, for most people. And I think he probably I'm not, I'm not sure what to think about myself, 
But even that argument still isn't really an argument about how the five discourses within Matthew connect to each other. It's really more of an external argument saying, okay, these may be an analog to the Pentateuch. And again, he may have something there or not. Um, the only other person that I've been able to find uh, that has made any suggestion about this is a Lutheran, a Missouri Synod Lutheran named David Scare. I think that's how you say his name, S-C-A-E-R, who has recently argued in a big book on the five discourses that um, the five discourses are, it's, it's actually a little confusing how he pans this out exactly, but that definitely are tied to being a catechumenate in the early church. So he's, are, and today he would say as well, so that the five discourses are um, things that a catechumen would learn and kind of go on the journey from their conversion up into their baptism and taking of the Eucharist in the early church, and in his case, in the Lutheran church today. And so there's one person who has tried to suggest that there is some sort of connection between the five discourses of Matthew, um, and he does do extensive work on that. But it, again, I, I don't find it, it's not really a literary argument that he makes, and it's also, um, I'm not entirely convinced that 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 works entirely. In fact, it's unclear how those are stages, for example. Other than that, I haven't really been able to find anybody. Again, if you know, if you run across someone who's arguing for the connection between the five major discourses, I would love to know that. I would suggest, however, that indeed there is a connection. Um, first, at the literary level, I like to think of the five major discourses as like the first, um, first five keys on a piano. So kind of C through E with one, three, and five, like the white key, so C, D, and E, that is the first, third, and fifth discourses, Sermon on the Mount, parables, and judgment. And then the second and fourth discourses, kind of like the black keys, C sharp and, and uh, E flat, if you will, or D sharp, if you want to call it that, um, that the five discourses go together in that kind of way. And what I mean by that is this, that if you look at one, three, and five, those are all very detailed content about the nature of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is announcing. The Sermon on the Mount, the parables discourse, and then the, the judgment discourse. Those are all explaining how God thinks about how things should be and how God's kingdom that Jesus is bringing about is about. Two and four have a different tone and a different feel, just like the black keys on the piano. Those are both about authority, and in the case of and they're to the disciples. They're not broad teachings about the kingdom of heaven. The second discourse there, the witness, is about the authority the disciples have as representatives of Jesus, as witness in the world. And the fourth discourse, if you, I'm counting on some math, general Matthean knowledge I hope you have here, the fourth discourse is the ecclesiological one. It's about the authority that now resides in the disciples, not the Sanhedrin, not Torah, not the Pharisees, as the true ecclesia, the true people of God, and that they have the authority to deal with their internal affairs. And so it seems to me there is, you know, it's kind of the first four into are the five discourses related to each other? It seems there is kind of a one, three, five, and a two, four pattern that, that connects those together in a very intriguing way. Um, but then going beyond that, I'll just state it here as I already did my thesis, I think there actually is a theme that is clearly woven through all five of these, and that is what I'm calling the theme of revelation and separation, or what I've titled this as kind of a theological epistemology. That is, what I think you find in all five discourses is that they are about the revelation that Jesus is giving results in the separating of people. And then the implication of that I've already mentioned is that that separation is a deconstructing of the people that enables a reconstructing or reconstituting of the people of God based not on ethnicity, but based on faith response or knowledge. And what I mean is this, in fact, the place you have to start to see this and the place I first saw it was in chapter 13, the middle of these, which is not insignificant. In fact, some scholars have argued even that all of Matthew is based on Matthew 13. I'm not 100% sure of that. I think there's something to it, but I would suggest that the five discourses are clearly based on chapter 13. And what I mean by that, if you were to look, and if you even have a Bible with you, you could look there, but I'll do a summary of it. If you think about the collection of parables in Matthew 13, you have seven parables that are, again, super highly structured. You have the parable of the sower, which is followed then by an explanation from Isaiah 6, very, very important, as you probably know. Um, and then you have six parables that are broken into a very powerful symmetric set of three and three. 
the second and the seventh are the same parable. Have you ever noticed that? The weed and the weeds and the dragnet of fish. The first and the, the second, that is after the heading, the kalal, the uferat, for you Hebrew people here, the, the, after the heading is there, the unpacking of it, the first and the last ones are the exact same parable. And why do I know they're the exact same parable? They have the exact same explanation given. At the end of the age, the angels will come and harvest and separate the good from the bad. And that's what the wheat and the tares and the dragnet of fish are about. Inside then, you, st you have two sets of three. You've got three agricultural parables, a story one, the wheat and the weeds, followed by two, med two um, uh, just similes, the, uh, help me, the mustard seed and the, um, uh, yes, is it the leaven? Yes, that's right. And then the second set, you have three sets of mercantile that work it out the back way. Two similes followed by that very same repeated Sorry, this isn't on the handout. Are you able to track with me? Does that make sense? So you got these heading parable of the sower and then these six parables. Well, what's consistent about that? That heading parable and that second and seventh, the ones that frame it, what are they all about? They're all about separating. The revelation comes and it separates people into different groups. And then lo and behold, when you look at the explanations for why Jesus is teaching in parables, there are several of them in there, but the biggest one is from Isaiah 6. It's exactly the same thing. It's so that some people will hear and see and understand, and some people won't. And of course, there's a big question about whether Matthew has changed Mark in that. Mark has the hina, and Matthew has hata there, and there's, you know, it's always a linguistic question how much distinction you can firmly make between them, or if Matthew has actually changed Mark stronger. This has happened, Jesus teaching parables, so that they won't understand, or whether Matthew has maybe somewhat softened that and left it a little bit more ambiguous. That's my, that's my, take on it, but you could debate that either way. The point is, chapter 13, I'd suggest to you, makes sense when you recognize that it's all about Jesus' revelation and on all the language of mysteries I mean, that's in there from Daniel. It's all, that's what chapter 13 is all about. It separates all people into different groups. So if that's true, if you'll just let that helicopter around your mind for a moment, then go sideways and look at the other discourses. How do the rest of them work out? Well, think with me about the Sermon on the Mount. The climactic end of the Sermon on the Mount is chapter 7, verses 13 to 27, where you have three metaphors, triads are always there in Matthew, which are the, um, the two ways, broad and narrow gate, the true and false prophets, and the wise and foolish builders. It's long recognized that that probably has some connections or refractions in the Didache idea of the two ways as well. Regardless, the clear point is the climactic end to the Sermon on the Mount is everybody, Jesus, there's no neutral ground with Jesus. You either go the broad or the narrow way, you're a true or false prophet regarding him, or you're a wise or foolish builder. I mean, there's no other option. It's a clear revelation results in separation of all peoples, no, no more neutrality. You get to chapter 10, the second major discourse. If you look at them, and I, I, maybe I could read a couple of verses here, what this is about is that as the disciples go out as the salt and light, the covenant enforcers as they go out after Jesus, the result is people are either going to receive them, and if they do, you give your peace to that house. If people reject you, you shake off the dust of your feet. And do you remember the statements that happened twice in the middle of that discourse? I have not come to bring peace, but to divide people. So he says, for example, uh, oh, I didn't even talk about right and other things, but he says that uh, in 1021, he's bringing not, oh, sorry, he'll separate brother from brother, father from child, children from parents, bringing a peace, not a sword. He comes to that uh, again in 1035 and says, he'll set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's no big feat, I guess, uh, in 1035. And the point being that chapter 10 separates all people based on their response to the authoritative disciples. Then we get to chapter 13, I've already said. Look ahead to chapter 18. What does chapter 18 end up being about? You're either in the ecclesia or you're not, right? And the church is given the authority to, we would say in our parlance, church discipline, but it's more than that. It's the binding and loosing whatever they decide and whoever they decide is in, is in, and whoever they decide is not, is not. That's the shock of chapter 18, that that authority has been given now to the disciples, to the ecclesia, not to Torah or Sanhedrin, or et cetera. And so it's clearly separating the people. And then you get to the fifth major discourse. There it's low-hanging fruit as well. You've got all the judgment coming, but how does the whole uh, fifth major discourse end? 
from the end of chapter 24 through chapter 25, you've got the parables of the 10 virgins who are split into five and five based on wisdom or foolishness. You have uh, the parable, the talents that Matthew puts there, interestingly, where people are split into three different responses. And then you have the uh, most literal of them, the sheep and the goats, and literal meaning people literally come to the king now. It's this apex image, and they're separated into the right and to the left to the sheep and the goats based on their, well, what, that's the question, probably based on their uh, reception of the little ones, the disciples back in chapter 10 is how I'd take that. So my point is, I think there is something going on between these five major discourses, that it's not just that they're each well-crafted, that Matthew's a pretty smart cookie and a highly skilled uh, artist, and he has put this theme throughout all of them. If that were just the case, that would be enough, but point three then, how am I doing on time? Okay, that's meaningless, but okay, all right, thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, is that, so I'll be more brief on this. Are there other places in Matthew that indicate that he's functioning in this kind of revelation separation or this epistemology being, a revealed epistemology being kind of determinative to who's in and who's out? I think there are. And there are lots of texts, but Pride of Place certainly goes to 1125 to 30. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This, this is basically chapter 13 done proleptically right at the end that this text immediately precedes the turning point of the book because in chapter 12, what follows is the two Sabbath controversies, which climaxes in 1214 of Matthew saying, at that point they gathered together, alluding to Psalm 2, and took counsel on how to destroy Jesus. That's the turning point of the book in the sense of that, after that, all interactions with Jesus are out to get him. That is, this is the part of that text that leads up to that. And then chapter 13 is the response to that. And the Jesus changes his ministry style from Sermon on the Mounty kind of stuff to hidden teachings, right? And this, so this text is not just an accident where it's placed and notice its key idea is Jesus reveals to some and not to others. And that results in this splitting of people as well. There are other texts, just if you just looked at the word suniemi or suneani uh, in the infinitival form, that's a major Matthean word that's been long recognized. Uh, Gerhard Bart wrote a famous redaction critical piece on this in 1963 that showed that um, that Suniemi is like a major way in which Matthew redacts Mark. He adds it in and, and changes things. I'll get to that here in just a second. Um, and that, all the verbs for seeing and, and, and knowing in Matthew as well. There, there are all these ways, and again, I'm just trying to be quick here, to say there's a lot of reason to believe that this theme I'm suggesting in the discourses isn't only in the discourses, it's in other places in Matthew as well. Okay, so then, what does that mean for point four then getting to the end here. So how does this connect to Watson? Again, we could just stop there and that would be, I'd love to hear some dialogue and I still would, but let me briefly try to put this into context of what Watson's arguing. As I said at the beginning, he's arguing that the fourfold gospel book, the canonization process invites and forces us even to read the four gospels together. I like that a lot. And he also suggests one th something more controversial that I'm also open to is that, that we can and should also read the Gospels, in can our canonical Gospels, in dialogue with, recognizing the distinction still, non-canonical Gospels. Because in the fluidity of their development, there's inevitably some interaction because all Gospels are, G are reception history or all Gospels are rewriting of the Jesus traditions. Right, have you just pondered that? Matthew is a reception history of Mark. Right? Matthew is a, re a rewriting of Mark. And then depending on your source critical analysis, for Watson, it's Mark, it's a cueless Mark and priority, right? So um, Mark, it goes Mark, Matthew, Luke, John is the compositional order. For me, I'm inclined to Mark, Luke, Matthew, John is, but I, you know, those things are impossible to say for sure. But no matter how you suss it out, all of those are reception history of each other. 
You think of Richard Bauckham's famous article, John for the Readers of Mark, a very important article where he explores what it would mean for John to be aware of the Mark and tradition, which there's good reason. Uh, Andreas Kostenberg, I was hoping to be here, has written an excellent essay in the Festschrift for Hengel on John's transposition, both of Mark and Luke, um, exploring some of these ideas as well. To use Watson language, let's just own what that is. That's reception history and that's valuable, okay? So if that's true, why not also ask how Thomas and Judas and others are themselves reception histories of the Jewish traditions while also recognizing that we would distinguish between a canonical and a non-canonical. That's his point, okay? So that's what I try to do in this last section. And I, I'll just do it briefly here. What is it, what, how does this revelation and separation theme work out in the fourfold gospel book? Well, it's very interesting. And I'll give you the brief Cliff Notes version of it. In Mark, it's pretty noticeably I mean, what's one of those famous things you think about Mark? You think about discipleship failure and their hardness of hearts. Like it's a long recognized theme in Mark. It's interesting that it is precisely in this point that I think Matthew takes up Mark and rewrites it in a little different way, particularly with these, this language of understanding, that instead of the disciples being depicted as having hard hearts and not understanding until after the resurrection, Matthew has them stumbling towards understanding, certainly, but he adds in a lot of emphasis on them being the ones who do understand as opposed to the ones outside who don't. So that's a, it's an interesting sort of way that Matthew, I think, clearly rewrites Mark, not in a contradictory way, none of these are contradictions, but in a, in a theologically appropriate way. When you turn to Luke, it's interesting, again, I'm doing this briefly here. When you turn to Luke, it's very interesting as well, and Joel Green has done some excellent work in a couple different places, um, tracing the idea of understanding through Luke, and what's what is Luke's, one of Luke's most important contributions? It's Luke chapter 24, that completely unique material where he gives this long exposition of the Emmaus Road experience and twice explains that Jesus opens their eyes and enables them to reread the Jewish scriptures in light of himself. I and mean, that's the climactic end to Luke. You have to just sort of own that and recognize that the significance that that's how Luke chooses to end. Well, it's interesting when you trace it back earlier, they are depicted as ones who, again, are stumbling towards understanding. They should understand, but they don't really. And then Luke, again, climaxes his book with a, basically a, a, a revelatory rereading, a reappropriating that is given uh, by Jesus. My point is the revelation theme and separation theme, less so, but the revelation theme is clearly there both in Mark and Luke. And then when you get to John, I mean, again, you don't have to have read very much in John to realize knowing is like a meta theme. And in fact, there are all kinds of essays on the epistemology of John. I mean, I've read quite a few of them. And Howard Key and William Abraham, all kinds of people have explored this. And it's because it's so much, obvi so obviously on the surface of John, the idea that n divine revealed knowledge is what separates the people. So that's the brief version to say, what I'm arguing in Matthew, I think, not only is arguable within Matthew itself, but it makes a lot of sense once you start paying attention to the fourfold gospel book that they all share this as a pretty foundational understanding of what Christianity is saying, that divinely revealed knowledge separates people. Then when you take the step to the non-canonical gospels, What's interesting is that at this point in my research, I was actually really disappointed because I thought I was going to find a lot of this and I didn't find much. I mean, at, you find it at a general level. So you think of Gospel of Thomas um, and Gospel of Judas, are probably the most obvious examples. All the infancy gospels and all the resurrection gospels about Pilate, Gospel of Nicodemus, all the, they have none of this stuff. It's mostly in the Gnostic works. And so you do have, of course, the same theme of Jesus is revealing special knowledge only to some. In the case of Thomas to Thomas, in the case of Judas to Judas, with what has to be one of the saddest verses in the ancient world, I'm revealing it to you so that you will know what you're not getting, you know, is what it says in Judas. I can't remember the, the verse. So, um, but the point is there's, there's this sort of general idea of revealed knowledge, but to me it strikes me as not particularly specific in the same way that the fourfold gospel book. I mean, because that's, that's kind of universal across Second Temple Jewish literature and Qumran, the Greco-Roman mystery religions would speak the same way. Obviously Gnosticism is some kind of, as it develops, is coming out in Greco-Roman mystery religions as well. So I was a little disappointed just in the sense that 
I didn't find that the non-canonical Gospels developed that theme in the same way or certainly to the same degree that the fourfold Gospel book does. And that actually makes me wonder of whether Watson's right. Because part of Watson's, not that that would defeat his whole argument, but part of Watson's argument is that there's actually nothing inherently different between the gospel, the canonical, and the non-canonical Gospels. And one argument isn't going to change that, but I just raise the question of, is that a pretty significant difference between the canonical Gospels and the non, is this emphasis on divine revelation of Jesus results in separation of people? I don't know. It's a question in my mind. Okay. Finally then, uh, rest of the New Testament documents in Christian theology and philosophy. All I'd want to say here, and then I'll stop, is that I think we could take Watson beyond where he takes himself in this question of if all things are reception history, which they are, how do the geostricians on Revelation and separation end up working out in the rest of the New Testament? Well, friends, I think it doesn't take very much thought to immediately think of the Corinthian correspondence and other places in the Pauline literature where he talks a lot about knowledge and having the knowledge that is given by the Spirit, something the Synoptic tradition doesn't tie, but John does. The giving of the Spirit is what gives a knowledge that is the knowledge of salvation, we might even say, or the, the knowledge of who God is in Christ. So I think that would be worthy of more explanation. And then further, you get into the patristic period. I think this is also the basis of the kind of the key hermeneutical principle of the fathers, which is the distinction between letter and spirit. And that is that when you read the fathers, you very quickly run into that the difference between a Christian reading and non-Christian reading is that anybody can read the letter of the words. It's that do you have this, the ability to read it spiritually? And I would suggest to you that they're getting that from Paul. Margaret Mitchell makes a very elegant argument about this in Paul, the birth of Christian hermeneutics. Let's see, Paul something in the birth of Christian, the Corinthian correspondence in the birth of Christian hermeneutics. And I think they're getting it from Paul, this idea of letter spirit from the Corinthian correspondence. And then also I think they're getting it from John, the same emphasis, but I would suggest to you, it's already there in Matthew, is what I'm, even before John, in terms of this idea of revealed knowledge, uh, gives a kind of way of reading that you did not know otherwise. Okay, so that's a lot. Um, I'll stop there and I would love to have any dialogue of any sort, if we have time, or are we out of time? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Jonathan, for a, uh, just a very interesting paper. And remember the ground rules of the discussion, right? In the Q&A, we go for the jugular of an idea, but not the jugular of a person, right? <laughs> oh, come on. This is very important to remember this. <laughs> so uh, we'll open the floor. We have about 20 minutes for uh, Q&A, which is, I think, perfect amount of time. So uh, if there are questions, please go ahead and raise your hand and uh, identify yourself and, and where you come from. My name is Anne Creenham. I have a missiologist question Great. on yeah. connections between uh, 938 and 10, 1 and following. Okay. And uh, something that frustrates me intensely is you constantly hear sermons about the fields are white and to harvest. Mm. Yet if you look at the uh, passage 9 leading into 10, Jesus proceeds to answer the prayer of chapter 9. And he appoints the disciples who are their own answer to the prayer. Uh, that, that uh, they are to be mm -hmm. the laborers to be sent out into the harvest. And so I think you can't understand that missiological passage at the end of chapter 9 without including chapter 10, and especially the difficulty of the harvest, which includes rejection. And so it's all too often harvest is thinking about just plucking ripe fruit, it's very easy, mm -hmm. no. Harvest is going into a very difficult situation. But seeing the connection between those two, I think, is mm -hmm. vital. But I'm not sure if you'd have any, any, yeah, any comment interesting. on that. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure all the implications of what you're saying. I thought at first you were going to suggest that maybe that prayer has been answered, so that necess isn't necessarily our, to be our prayer. Or pray that the Lord will send out laborers mm. harvest, and guess what? You're probably the answer to I see. Prayer. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I think that's very insightful, especially I think it's very practical to emphasize, as you have just noted, that that going out isn't just a plucking the cream of the crop. It's going out and receiving if I'm right about chapter 10, two different receptions, exactly. right, that are some very difficult, and indeed persecution is the theme of chapter 10 more than anything, isn't it? Yeah, so that's, maybe that would dissuade more people to going into missions, that'd be awesome. So, just kidding. <laughs> but you're right, that's a, that's a uh, the really healthy reminder, thank you, that that's, that verse isn't all positive in that sense. So, thank you for that, yeah. I don't have any further comment beyond that, but thanks, yeah. Yep. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. 
uh, Nathan Rottlehoover, and uh, I just teach high school, so <laughs> nothing just important. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so one question about uh, Matthew's sort of separation motif. Um, how does that balance out with what also seems to be very apparent as an inclusion motif, uh, especially as you see it in the non-discourse sections like the genealogy, the inclusion of the five women who are, well, not Mary, but just from different yeah. places geographically, also how that counterbalances with Matthew 18 to go out into all the, the world. Yeah. So the disciples are not on a mission of really separation, they're on a, a mission of like inclusion, it yeah. seems. No, that's your, um that's great, and I, I said something very briefly to that effect, but the reception history that I'm receiving right now says that I wasn't clear on that, and that is that um, the, I think that's a false dichotomy, Nathan, in the sense that it's not that they are separating people or they're including all people, it's precisely the separation, the revelatory separation, the theological epistemology that deconstructs who the people of are so that they can be reconstituted as people from Gen Jew and Gentile, right? So Matthew gives us all these stories right from the beginning, as you know, this, the Magi believe and the Jerusalemites do not, right? They bow down and worship even, um, where the Herodians just try to kill him. Uh, and then uh, chapter eight, you already have before, you know, the Great Commission that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, in response to the centurion's healing, et cetera. Canaanite woman is contrasted with the Jerusalemites. So Matthew gives us all these vignettes, but I'm saying that those are part of the big point he's making is that the people of God are now redefined based not on ethnicity, but on how they respond to Jesus. In fact, one of the most important things about a narrative critical reading of Matthew is to recognize that stories are juxtaposed next to each other as foils of the opposites often. So again, the Canaanite, the Jerusalemites come down and they're mad that people are not washing their hands when they eat. And then the Canaanite woman shows up and she's committed with great faith. That's just one example of a, a thousand ways that Matthew puts stories next to each other. You're supposed to look at them together and say, holy cow, that's like the opposite of each other. And we're meant to see that. And of course there are no Canaanites, right? I mean, to call her a Canaanite woman is like classic intertextual evocation. You know, she's a Syrophoenician woman, according to Mark. To say she's a Canaanite woman, in contrast to the Jerusalemites, could not be a more stark, evocative statement to say, here's two different kinds of people, and who has faith and who doesn't. So, that, so those stories about people coming to faith who are Gentiles is part of the deconstructing and the reconstituting of the people of God. I interpret chapters 14 and 15 along these lines, and I skipped a lot of this in the paper, as two exoduses. You've got the Jewish re-exodus done and they have a Gentile re-exodus done with wilderness feedings and water crossings with 12 baskets and seven baskets, which Matthew invites a typological reading of that. He brings it back up in chapter 16. It says, did you not understand about the 12 and the seven? I mean, it's shocking. And so I think those, I, so I affirm that observation. I'm saying that's exactly what I'm saying in the sense that that is what enables the reconstitution is the separation of people. Does that make sense or? Okay. Thanks, yeah. Other questions? Dave Phillips, Dr. Pennington, thank you so much for, for this presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was very informative. Uh, could you uh, briefly talk about uh, the, uh, the parables again? And, and you mentioned okay, the, the heading parable and then parables two and seven and, yeah. and the connections between there. How do parables three through six uh, fit into that? How, wh yeah, what, uh, what do they contribute or how should they be read perhaps differently in light of that connection? Yeah, so there's a lot going on there. I, I think at the specific level, parables three through six do not explicitly teach the revelation and separation theme, right? Um, but that's okay. I don't think that's a defeater to my argument because I'm not saying everything in Matthew has to say that, especially when the framing things are, are um, that, uh, teaching that. So I, I would acknowledge that those are about gro mysterious growth, I think is what the four inside ones are, um, both agricultural and mercantile. Um, I'm sorry, the first two are about growth, second two are about um, value, mysterious value, mysterious growth, mysterious value is how I put those. But at a macro level, it's interesting, and I skipped this in the paper, if you think about the work of Tom Wright and Jesus and the Victory of God, and then my good friend Grant McCaskill in his uh, published dissertation from St. Andrews on um, inaugurated eschatology, 
Um, in both of those, both those scholars point out that parabolic teaching in the Second Temple period, and in the Old Testament even, but especially in the Second Temple period, is an eschatological revelatory act that separates people, basically. So to use McCaskill's argument, he shows that 4Q instruction, uh, Second Enoch, and Matthew all share a part of the kind of bedrock of Second Temple Judaism, that at the end, the Messiah is a sage, it's a sapiential reading, who reveals eschatological wisdom to the elect. That's like a common thread in Second Temple Judaism. And that makes sense of what Jesus is doing in the parables. He's giving these mysterious sayings. So, so even the ones that aren't explicitly about revelation separation, I would argue, are part of this whole way. And that's what Tom Wright argued in Jesus and the Victory of God, if you may recall, is that Jesus as a prophet um, is, a is the one who gives mysteries that some understand and some don't, Isaiah 6 being the kind of the bedrock of that. And so that, again, all that parabolic discourse is revelatory and separating, I think, even if the content of the specific ones aren't. And then Matthew makes clear, though, I think, that we see the revelation separation by making the first, second, and seventh about that. So thanks. Good, good question. So, Other questions? <clears throat> Dr. Pratt? <laughs> So, uh, regarding the Sermon on the Mount, has the way he ends that with those three mini parables uh, caused you to rethink the centrality of the SM? I know you used to think that the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, was central to the structure, or at least its content. Has it caused you to rethink uh, how the SM is structured, or the centrality of the sermon of the prayer? Yeah, good question. Um, I would say, Nathan and I have had some good conversation about this recently because he's not just a high school teacher, he's doing a PhD on the Sermon on the Mount, so, um, so we talk about these things. Um, yeah, I would say the theme of, it depends on what question you're asking about the sermon. The theme is 517 to 20, and particularly greater righteousness. I think that's the tapas of the sermon. Um, the literary center of it is the Lord's Prayer, there's no doubt, I mean, literally the, the center of it in every structural analysis it has to be the Lord's Prayer. I don't think that means that the Lord's Prayer drives all the sermon. Some people have argued that, I'm not convinced of that, but it's still, I think, the center, no doubt. So if you're talking about what's the top boss, it's greater righteousness. If you're talking about the literary center, it's six, nine to 15. Um, so then how do those, what I'm saying, the revelation separation, I would say that that ending to the sermon is the way that Matthew ties all five together. And so it's an appropriate ending, even though that's not the whole point of the sermon, which I wasn't suggesting it was the whole point, but that's how it ends because that's how all the non-13, non-chapter 13 parables all, well, I'm sorry, I should say one and five end climactically with clear revelation separation. Two and, ten, two and four have it woven in and 13 is all about it, is how I'd take it. So I would say that recognizing that in the, last discourse and the first discourse that's the climactic end doesn't mean that that's the only thing going on in those discourses nor the only thing it's just the way that matthew ties the five together so it's a good clarifying question thank you for that yeah are there questions i live in the world of matthew and so i hope that all this stuff makes sense you know what i mean i find myself talking throwing out verses and things and so i hope somebody other than chuck understands what i'm saying because it's like it's all clear in my mind but i realize it may not be enough shared knowledge here not that you're not intelligent people i just mean you haven't been as long in that so yep yeah david beck i teach new testament fortunately i'm here because Wednesday, I'm going to finish up Matthew, and now I can get it right. Okay, and, good. Uh, Thank you. I'm glad to. <laughs> in light of that, I, uh, I'm curious as to what led you to include uh, chapter 23 in the final discourse and uh, how it changes your understanding. Changed of my that life. Discourse. I received chapter 23 into my heart. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. My, uh, yeah, I, I didn't even understand the significance of the arguments before. I was kind of dismissive of it for some reason. I don't know why. Just hadn't studied it. Uh, for me, what was the smoking gun finally was all the work I've done in the Beatitudes and recognizing that the Beatitudes, the macarisms in chapter five, um, you always include woes with macarisms. And Luke makes it really clear, doesn't he? In, uh, is it chapter 11? Where his, he's got four is it 
six. Yeah, it's six. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. See, Luke screwed up Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. That's why it had to be Luke Matthew, not Matthew Luke. I can't, imbi- I can't believe that Matthew would screw, or Luke would screw Matthew up that much. But um, the, in chapter six, you've got four macrisms followed by four woes. That's the normal pattern in ancient literature. I mean, you don't always have to have them, but usually you do have them together. So one of the really weird things about Matthew's lengthy macrisms is that he never, he doesn't give the woes. And notice, macrisms, this is a whole other discussion. Macrisms are not blessings. They're not blessings, curses. They are statements, they're observations about the state of human flourishing. Woes are observations about the state of non-human flourishing. Woe to one. A woe is not a curse. Totally distinct Hebrew and Greek words, completely different. You have to honor that. But the big point is Matthew's macrisms receive their complementary woes at, in this perfectly placed end of the fifth discourse. And I'm not, that's not unique to my argument. I mean, it just finally dawned on me the significance of that. That was kind of the smoking gun for me. Um, and that, and then the second thing is Matthew 23 is a discourse. It's not a narrative. And so if you really follow the structure of Matthew carefully, there is no room for a non-placed section of Matthew. Now, some would have actually heard that there is, but I'm just not convinced that his literary artistry is that poor. It's so thought through that if you don't put 23 with the last discourse, then it doesn't, it doesn't fit into the whole structure of the, just of the whole book, I think. So those are the two main reasons. So, but it took me a long time to come to that, you know. So I've haven't. I'm teaching Matthew again in the spring, and I haven't. I've been on sabbatical, so I haven't taught it. And I've got to change all my handouts and change everything because of this darn conversion. But uh, so, thanks. Good question. Thank you, Dr. Pennington. Um, my name is Andrew Kutz here. I am actually going to be presenting my first ETS paper good for you. on Matthew 10:34 through 39. Oh, good. And there's a lot of these themes there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Uh, this is really insightful, Good. really helpful. Um, on the theme of revelation, um, do you see a progression of the content of that revelation? Um, particularly, you know, as I look at it broadly, um, you know, if, if Matthew 13 is sort of the crux, and then you have the narratives that are following, um, sort of following out of that, you know, which you've, I think is a good argument. Um, and then you have in Matthew 16, of course. You know, I skipped all Peter's that. I just realized Caesarea Philippi, like all of that is coming off of 13 is what I meant exactly. to argue. So yeah, the, right. I think that fits really well. Yeah. Um, and sort of like this is the crux. We have the, on a discourse level, Matthew 13, and then we have in the, in the narrative. The narrative is unpacked that very theme. And exactly out of that, right. you know, Matthew 18 is now the church. And then exactly. eschatologically how that pulls out. So that's, that's just exactly more of amusing right. and just kind of checking in and see what you thought. I totally skipped that in my okay. paper, I just realized. Yeah, so the, what's interesting, it's not only the Caesarea Philippi Confession, but what's the pericope right before that? It's the Jesus teaching that they should have understood the figural reading he's offering about the yeast of the Pharisees. And they don't, Sunni and I, they don't, they don't understand because they're still thinking literalistically rather than figurally, right? Which I think is... A very patristic kind of move. Jesus was a patristic. Maybe that's what my, my argument. Um, but the so I do think those are stemming off of thirteen very naturally. So good observation. Yeah, I totally agree. So and then what is the Matthean redaction of the Caesarea Philippi Confession? Blessed Macarius are you not blessed Macarius are you Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father's heaven. That's not in Mark. That is, a, that is a Matthean addition that I think is very relevant after chapter 13. So I'm so glad you said that, yeah. So. Could I ask a question? Please. So, uh, and this is just something that uh, in a lot of your, your thesis, I'm just curious to know your thoughts on. So, um, so Jesus, the revelation of Jesus, the un- unveiling of Jesus uh, kind of brings separation. Um, how do you, how do you, deal with the fact that the, the way Jesus seems to be presented in the first four chapters or so is the fulfillment of the story of Israel, or is fulfillment of Israel hmm. in a real way. And then you have these 12 disciples, which sound a lot like 12 tribes so to me. on the opposite of kind of a separation. Yeah, sense, well, right? I don't know. I don't know that it's, it's, it, it, does, it unravels it or anything. I'm just wondering your thoughts, because that's the thing that I kept th- coming back to is like, oh, Yes, there's separation, but there's already a story in place, an identity yeah. in place. 
I think I'd answer it with the way he would answer it. Biblos Genesaos Huya Dawid Huya Abraham. And that that's the statement of Matthew. I mean, there's a million statements of Matthew, but that's how he chooses to begin it. And that's that Jesus is the Messiah who is simultaneously the son of Abraham, son of David and the son of Abraham, which in my mind, reading Matthew as a whole, means he is both the Jewish Messianic king and he's the father of all nations. And I think the rest of the gospel plays that out pretty nicely. And what about the 12 disciples as being representative or something like that of 12 tribes? Do you buy into that at all? Or? Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, I guess I would say that that fits in a salvation historical reading and that, the, the, that Israel is the vehicle through which all the nations receive the blessing then.